Hi, Bobcats. In this section, we're going to take a look at data that's presented in the media as being scientific and try to develop some tools to analyze how accurate that data might be. Our objectives are to critically analyze this data and to recognize common errors that are made in interpreting such data. These two graphs represent um, a theory that was uh, getting a lot of uh, internet time earlier this year. Uh, people were trying to claim that 5G uh, cell service was causing COVID-19 and they create graphs like this that were showing that at that time the areas that were dealing with significant COVID-19 infections um, correlated with areas that had 5G service. Um, but let me propose an alternate explanation that is um, probably much more on point, which is that 5G service is going to be available in areas that have a lot of population, and COVID-19 would initially spread through areas that had a lot of people present. So just because there's a correlation between two things, such as 5G and COVID-19, doesn't mean that one causes another. So let's be clear about what I mean by correlation and causation. Um, correlation is when there's apparently a connection between two things, such as um, 5G availability versus um, areas of COVID-19 inf infections. Causation means that one thing is directly responsible for causing the other thing. And correlation and causation are often uh, confused, and that can lead to all sorts of um, uh, errors. To give you some more examples of the difference uh, between correlation and causation, take a moment and explore this link. And um, this will definitely show you a bunch of things um, that clearly are correlated, and clearly one of them does not cause the other. This rough guide to spotting bad science is something that a colleague sent my way a few years ago, and I think it's just a great uh, concise presentation of some of the most common um, ways in which scientific data can be misinterpreted. If, um, if you want an easier to read copy of this, there's a link in our course site uh, to this document. Um, a lot of these things have to do with how scientific findings are communicated. So those will be things like the first two, the sensationalized headlines and misinterpreted results. Remember that old phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. So sometimes you may have um, um, it, some sort of a finding, say, that um, looks really exciting and it potentially could do something really good. And so they skip the fact that this is a small step towards the final goal and the headline says, cancer is cured. Um, and so that, that would be an example of sensationalized headlines. Um, misinterpreted results, that can happen when um, somewhere along the way um, in trying to communicate the science, um, all of the, the qualifiers and the, well, these are just preliminary results, and well, it worked in this small test case, but we haven't tested it in a large enough population yet. All of those sorts of things get lost. Um, sometimes even um, the, the results can um, look like they're pointing one direction, um, but they really aren't when you look at it much more closely. And so there are all sorts of ways that data can be misinterpreted. Um, number three, with conflicts of interest, is huge. This is when, say, in the 1950s, um, some cigarette companies were paying for scientific studies that concluded cigarettes either were not bad for you or even possibly were good for you. Um, so there's a direct conflict of interest in those cases. We've already looked at correlation and causation. 
um, unsupported conclusions. Um, the data just really don't support what um, what sort of point is trying to be made about the data. Um, the next grouping all have to do with the experimental design. Um, when you design an experiment, there are all sorts of factors that you have to consider. Um, if your sample size is too small, you can't say that your, your results are general. Um, if the sample that you're using is not representative of the population at large, then your results may be skewed. Um, for instance, with our COVID-19 situation, if the only people you were running tests on were, say, people who had been living in nursing homes or assisted living facilities, um, you're going to get a really different result than if you ran the same test on a bunch of 20-year-old uh, college students. No control group. Um, hopefully, y'all remember from um, a previous course that a, a control group is a group that, um, like, let's say you're testing a new medication, the control group would receive a placebo. And then you, you could compare the results of the group that were receiving a new medication to the results of the control group to see if there actually was anything good caused by the medication. Um, blind testing refers to the person participating in the test doesn't know if they received the medication or the placebo. And in double blind, the person administering the test also does not know. Uh, point number 10 here, selective reporting of data that's often referred to as cherry picking. Um, when you're looking at your data set, you only choose to present the data that support your conclusion and you ignore this wealth of data that contradicts your wanted conclusion. Unreplicable results, um, that'll happen when you do the experiment and you just can't reproduce it. And then peer review, that last point, is an is a critical part of the scientific process because it takes somebody's work and before it gets published in a peer-reviewed journal, other scientists take a look at it. Other scientists who are experts in the field will take a look at it. And um, often the peer review process um, catches problems with experimental design or with the interpretation of results. And so that the back and forth of that peer review process is a very important part of the scientific method. In terms of our current situation with COVID-19, um, there is a lot of push for scientists to release preliminary results. So preliminary means um, maybe these results have not been reproduced even in the researcher's own lab yet, or they definitely have not been peer reviewed yet. So why are we doing this? Well, scientists and doctors have a moral and an ethical responsibility to find treatment and to fight COVID-19 now. Treatment that we're using, um, things like medication, and there are many, many different um, medications that are being looked at at the moment. Um, I just saw a headline in the news this morning as I'm recording this on uh, July 5th, 2020, that the Austin and San Marcos area hospitals um, are receiving shipments of uh, one of the, the antiviral drugs um, that is showing some promise in fighting COVID-19. Um, we're also trying to treat it uh, with various therapies, including using ventilators. On the prevention side, at Texas State, we're going for a three-prong approach, social distancing, wearing face masks, and hand washing. And then, of course, there's this huge push um, for vaccination development. Um, so that, that's what we're, we're trying to do to fight it. And the demands um, of treating people right now who are in dire need um, can be in conflict with sound scientific processes. Um, truly studying and figuring out this disease is going to take a very long time, on the order of years. 
Um, we have all kinds of sampling issues with the studies that are being done. Um, studies are being done on, on patients who've been hospitalized. And so um, fortunately, um, that's a relatively speaking small number of people for, for these types of scientific studies. Ideally, you'd have many, many more people participating in these studies. Um, so we're having small sample sizes and the populations may not be um, representative of our overall population. And then we also have incredible experimental design problems. If you could do an absolutely perfectly designed controlled experiment, you would have uh, a data set that looked very, very different from what we're dealing with right now. Um, we, it's difficult to have a, a control group when you're trying to alleviate symptoms in, of a disease in people. It's not ethical to not treat their disease. Um, no blind testing. Um, everybody involved is pretty much going to know what medication they're getting, uh, what the dosage is, the frequency. Um, we're going to have inherent conflicts of interest, and that's not a um, that's that's not meant as a, a criticism of anybody. It's you know when you're trying to treat people in a medical setting you're going to use the tools that you have at hand and so if you have um, something available you're going to try to use it for treatment um, and so some of those types of things can develop as conflicts of interest because you're you're doing the best you can in the situation uh, non-replicable results because these are uh, relatively small scale studies uh, cherry picking of data um, when when you're running small studies and you see some data points that look like they might be promising you're going to run with it um, and lack of peer review there are um, various sites that have been set up for scientists to share preliminary results which is speeding up the scientific process tremendously but it's also sidestepping um, that whole process of peer review so um, because we need to develop something right now um, we're, we're seeing a lot of back and forth in um, the treatment, a drug that showed promise early, then studies were done and said, no, it didn't show promise. Um, but just this week I saw, well, a much better design study had been done and it showed if people uh, were, received this drug early in the process, it really helped. But in the previous studies, people had received the drug later. So we're going from, hey, maybe this drug will help to, ooh, this drug didn't help. And now we're back to, yes, we have solid data that shows this drug does help. So it's, it's all uh, complicated. Okay, so to circle back around to our primary objectives for this section, um, hopefully I've provided you some tools to help you uh, analyze scientific data, such as to look for um, uh, cherry picking of data or to look for correlation uh, versus causation. And um, hopefully this will um, help you keep a critical eye toward anything um, that uh, gets presented to you.